Uh, thank you very much. And indeed, it's a great pleasure to be here back in Siam in this uh, what looks like a wonderful week. The small problem that I would like to be able to duplicate myself in two to follow the parallel sessions <laughs> at the same time. And I think I'm not the only one in this situation. So let's go immediately to the definition. And I hope this is readable even like this. So take a group G acting on a, a OK, I hope it was still. G acting on a, let's say, a topological space. This is automatic. If, well, first you have L, an omega regular language. So this means that there's an automaton. <coughs> so L, let's say, infinite words over some alphabet A. <coughs> there's a finite automaton with a, so that's a graph with edges labeled by A oriented edges, <coughs> some initial states, and some accepting states. Now, since you're reading infinite words, you cannot use the standard formalism of automata and say that you stop in an accepting state, because you never stop. So the condition is sometimes called the Burry condition, which is you have to go infinitely many times through an accepting state. We're going to see very soon some examples of this. <coughs> but for now, let's just take this as a definition. It sounds very weird the first time you hear it, but actually it's a, it's a good notion. <coughs> so you need this. L must be a coding. So let's say this is a bijection. Homeomorphism like this. <coughs> And for every group element, its action must be automatic. And uh, this is expressed by the graph of the action, but not graph in the sense of automaton, graph in the sense of you know, classical graph for a function. So we'll say that if you look at the, the set of, say, pi inverse of x, pi inverse of gx, that's really the graph x, g, x of the transformation g. This must be omega regular. Now it's a pair of words. So it's in L cross L, if you want, is the graph. So that's in omega a to the omega cross a to the omega. And that's the same thing as a cross a, repeated infinitely many times. So that's an automaton that accepts pairs of letters rather than letters. OK, so that's the definition. And I want to go as quickly as possible to some examples. So rather than make this uh, too formal, let me go immediately to an example and explain the example and why it belongs to a. So the example, the first example we can think about is that of automatic groups. A quick note is I prepared some slides, but I forced myself not to put it a single word in the slides, only pictures. Because I realized that when, it, when you put words in slides, it goes too fast. Yeah, uh, OK, so um, this is not going to work. <laughs> uh, I hope that the slides and the text were both going to be readable at the same time. <clears throat> yeah, so here L is a language. <clears throat> and if you look at this language, we'll see that it's omega regular. It goes as follows. It starts at the initial state, which is marked by the arrow. Then it either goes up and follows the plus branch, then loops at plus, and then reads a 0. And then it goes to the rightmost state, which is a loop at 0, and which is the only accepting state. 
Or you can go on the bottom branch, you start reading minuses, you do this for some time, but after that you have to stop and you have to go to the zeros. So plus to the infinity or minus to the infinity are not accepted because they don't go even a single time through the accepting state. So the set of expressions that you read is just some string of pluses, perhaps zero, or some string of minuses, zero, but anyway it's a finite string. And then you go to the zero to the infinity. So this language is naturally in bijection with the integers, some number of pluses or some number of minuses. So this is the language we're talking about. And if you had started by an x, well, find some bijection between z, your favorite set, and this language here, which is just counting the number of pluses or minuses. And then I claim that for every g acting by translation on the integers, the transformation is omega regular. Now it's easy to see that it's enough to check this for generators. So we could insert generators here. These are classical properties of omega regular languages that you can multiply two languages you can take the Cartesian product, you can intersect with the projection, and in this way you get composition, and you get inverses of anything. <coughs> so here, the generator, whoops, is exactly this. The generator T of, oh, so because of the slides you don't see here that they were supposed to be written here, Z equal generated by T. So T is the generator, that's the initial state, and well, how do you add one to a number written in unary? Well, as long as you see pluses, you skip them. Then when you see zero, you put an extra plus, and you're done. Or if you see some minuses, you skip them, and at some moment, you erase. Then you erase the last one, in fact, you see, because after that, there would be some zeros. Yes? Can I ask what's happening here? We are checking that if we have two infinite words, that one has Exactly, or one minus less. Exactly, yeah. So we are really realizing the operation plus one on <coughs> numbers written in unary. And in case that the number was zero, so it goes directly here, then we have to replace the first zero by a plus, and we're done. Note that this is um, deterministic in the sense that it defines the graph of a bijection. For every input word, there will be exactly one output word that realizes the number plus one, and conversely, for minus one. On the other hand, if you just look at the inputs, here you're reading some minuses, and here you're looping with the minuses, and at some moment you make a choice. Either you're going to write a minus as the result of the operation, or you're going to write a zero, and you don't know. But afterwards you will know. If you started to go on this branch, you must read some zeros as an input, and if you stayed here, you must read some minuses on input. So it is well defined, <coughs> and it is deterministic, but if you project to the inputs or the outputs, it stops being of that form. It needs some look ahead. It needs to guess what the next symbol is. Okay, so this class of uh, automatic groups is very important. I guess the, uh, the names to quote are canon, Epstein, uh, can I give the whole names? Holt, I'm, I have the feeling I'm forgetting somebody. Patterson, Thurston, or oh, maybe Levy also. <coughs> so Thurston uh, studied these groups because they're very important in the description of fundamental groups of three manifolds. In fact, uh, so, so three manifolds can be cut into pieces, <coughs> and the hyperbolic pieces will have an automatic group as a fundamental group. And uh, in fact, the other geometries, are, well, some will, some will not, but the ones that cannot have alternative description by matrices. So the different pieces can either be described as automatic groups or as linear groups. That's the, the main thing about uh, uh, group theoretical study of three manifolds. <coughs> okay, 
So I guess this is about everything I wanted to say about automatic groups. <coughs> and if we think about our definition, hopefully this will still fit on the board. Here we're making some specific choices. These correspond to our group is given with a generating set S. <coughs> And here I used uh, plus and minus and zero for my language, but they naturally correspond to T, T inverse, and identity in the group. And S has to be equal to A. And then L is a normal form. <coughs> it's a padded normal form for G. So here <coughs> we have words, and here we have the group. Oh, I should have said also x equals g. So you look at the group with a, say, regular right multiplication action. And then the definition of automatic group, well, you can accept this one as a definition. It just says that if you're given a normal form for a group element, you can get a normal form for that element multiplied, say, on the right by a generator. And then all the algorithmic properties of these things follow from the fact that you're working with regular languages. <coughs> so this notion has been generalized to a, what is called KV graph automatic. Sorry. Yes? What if you do the same thing with regular languages of finite words? Yes. So the classical definition of automatic group is indeed given in terms of regular languages. It's bad because A star cross A star is not the same thing as A cross A star. Mm -hmm. So you have to introduce some extra padding. You have to look at this, and then you have to put extra symbols on one side or on the other. Apart from that, yes, the theory could have been explained in terms of actions on finite words. What I'm going to say later does not work. So I really believe this is the correct definition. But for automatic groups, yes, both, both are equivalent, really. <clears throat> so Cayley graph automatic is just dropping the assumption that uh, L is a normal form. So that's just saying that x is equal to g, regular action. So uh, I guess the people who worked on this would be who sign off. Uh, Lampovich. Am I forgetting some names? Yes, Nikov, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably in the 90s. <clears throat> no, more recently. Around 2010. So, this is a more general notion. There are some groups which have this property of being Cayley graph automatic without uh, being automatic in the sense of these people. And they still have exactly the same good properties. For example, that the word problem is solvable in quadratic time, the Dean function has quadratic complexity, and so on. <coughs> also, uh, yes? Exactly. You don't need to know that, in fact, plus can be interpreted as t, and zero is identity, and minus is t inverse. Yeah, exactly. Well, in fact, in the notion of Cayley graph automatic, you could also have uncountable groups. Ah, uh, for here, yes. It means that there is a symbol. So S contains the identity. And then the words are written with infinitely many identities. Yeah, exactly. Of course. So there's an notion of automatic graph, which I don't know very well, but I was wondering if 
Yeah, so I want to say just a few words on, on something which is closely related to all of this, which is the notion of an automatic structure. So an automatic structure is just L, an omega regular language, and a collection of relations. So R I. Oh, I'll do my best. So. Uh, we can turn it off for a second, yes. <coughs> so an automatic structure will be L, some omega regular language, and relations are I in L to uh, some arity and I. Finitely many. So really, what I am defining here with my automatic uh, action is if you're given a finitely generated group, you give yourself L, and you give yourself the graph of n generators. So you give n relations with uh, n i equal 2, which are exactly the graph describing some action. And then you put some axioms. For example, that this is a bijection. So for every x, there exists a unique y such that x, y is in the graph. And when you talk about uh, an automatic graph, you mean exactly this, that there is a regular language describing the vertex set, and the relation is an automatic language. People talk about graph theory, but there's no such thing as graph theory, right? It's the theory of a single binary relation. That's exactly what graph theory is. So you give yourself the structure in this sense. And there's a fundamental uh, property uh, that's due to Nerod and uh, Hosseinoff. <coughs> I guess in the 90s, if I remember, it's 95. Which is that uh, the first order theory is decidable for any automatic structure. So this means you write any statement for every x, there exists a y such that for every z, there and so on, and then some complicated expression using the relations. It's decidable, whether it's true or false. And in fact, this can be extended because you can give yourself uh, counting uh, predicates. So you can also write the quantifier. There exists uh, n solutions exactly to something. There exists countably many solutions to something. There exists uh, uncountably, that's supposed to be an LF. Uh, the cardinalities in this kind of structure can only be countable or LF1. I mean, oh, oh, sorry, two to the LF. So you can add that kind of quantifier to ask the number of solutions to, some, to something. So you can see there can exist exactly countably many solutions to this problem. And you also have, uh, um, so there exist k mod n solutions. You can also add that kind of, uh, of a quantifier, and it's still decidable. So you can ask the number of solutions to this equation is odd. That's something that can be decided. And it all comes down to the fact that lots of operations are decidable on omega regular languages. So essentially, for every first order formula plus each of these extra quantifiers, it's possible to construct an omega regular language that encodes its solutions and then test for emptiness of this language. OK, so this is something that, we're, that we will definitely use. <coughs> something else I wanted to say on this 
in this topic. <coughs> yes, so two small remarks. One, which is that in the definition here of pi, the encoding, sometimes, oop, can I try to fix this? You can try to make it um, more general. So you can, you could ask that this is not a bijection, but that it's just an onto map and that it has a kernel, a relation, which are the things that are glued together. And this should also be omega automatic. So you represent x as a quotient of a language. You encode it, but not in a unique way. And then you must remember this non-unicity in the form of an automatic. So that's a useful extension. You can encode lots of things in this manner. <coughs> I won't go too much into the details of that extra notion. <coughs> it's, a different notion right? it's a different notion. Yes, it's not equivalent. For example, here, the x I can code has to be totally disconnected. Ville? So, uh, something that I wanted to actually ask just before you did <coughs> that is uh, what is the role of the topology on, on X? Because you could have, for example, a free action of G on some topological space, but we know that there are a bunch of different free actions. But then you, when, you use the, when you have an action on L, you can have, still have a free action of, let's say, G is a free group. Well, L has its topology too. Yes, but they have, ah, so you are saying that L should inherit the topology from... Oh, yes, yes, this map, uh, that's what the squiggle means. <coughs> yes, yes, okay, but so we are in no way encoding the topology in the... We, we don't have some kind of automatic encoding of the topology. We are just saying that... Well, the topology is part of the omega structure for L. I mean, okay, so you are saying that this bijection has to be a homeomorphism yes. where L is, where L already has the counter topology. Exactly, topology. yes. Okay, because... And then, in the more general notion, uh, the map pi should be continuous subjective. And the kernel will be some closed relation expressing what is glued to what. Yeah, exactly. OK, the other small remark is you could have wanted to define an automatic structure for a group by saying that its multiplication table is automatic. So maybe a quick warning sign. We could. We could, but we don't do it. <coughs> we could ask, say, x is equal to g. And then you look at the graph, maybe equal to l. You look at the, at the set of triples x, y, z, such so that x, y is equal to z. That's really the whole multiplication table, if you want. And you could ask this to be omega regular. That's a very interesting notion, but it's almost entirely disjoint from what we're doing here. So here we just say that the generators individually give automatic transformations. If we were to ask this, and we add on top, say that G is finitely generated, then this forces G to be virtually abelian. You can really not go far beyond if the whole multiplication table is automatic. OK, it's high time to get back to my examples. So sorry about the. Uh, Back and forth. <coughs> can I do both? No, I cannot do both simultaneously. OK, so there's a completely different notion on, which consists now of really using the fact that the action doesn't have to be free. <coughs> so here I give the example of z squared. Here, take as a language just all the words over 0 and 1. No restriction at all. The full shift, if you want. <coughs> and this is an, another example of an automatic action. It's still an action of t. But now you see what t does is it works not in unary, but in binary. So when it reads a 1, it prints a 0. And this is just writing a carry. And it keeps working on the binary expansion of a number. And then when it sees a 0, it drops the carry. And then it goes to the identity. So you understand very well that t is plus 1. 
in binary notation. And in fact, I had to force t also to be an accepting state, because minus 1 is represented as an infinite string of 1s, which goes to the infinite string of zeros. So you have to remain here. OK, and another example is uh, this group generated by two transformations, A and U, which are both of order 2. So A just flips the first bit. 0 goes to 1, 1 goes to 0, and then it does the identity, while u here skips all the ones it can, then preserves the next 0, and then does a flip by a. And again, u has to be accepting if I am to read an infinite collection of ones. <coughs> so this is the whole universe of automata groups and not automatic groups, uh, a theory that was developed by uh, different people, but Certainly, Alyoshin was very important. Uh, Grigorchuk, and we're going to get very soon to his work. But Eilenberg also contributed to this topic, as did uh, Hungarians such as uh, Getscheg. And if we focus on this example here of uh, this transformation with a U that loops on the one, <coughs> you see U loops on the one and then transitions to this operation of flipping a bit. And we can take this transformation and explode the U into three states called B, C, and D. And they do the same thing. So they, they loop on a one, and then they preserve the next zero. And then this was supposed to be zero goes to one, one goes to zero. So this is the A that we had before. But you see that depending on the value modulo three, of where we are in the cycle, we will sometimes do an A and sometimes not do anything and preserve. So this is the Grigorchuk group. That's a famous example of a group which is infinite torsion, so every element has finite order, <coughs> and also a group of intermediate growth. So if you look at the number of group elements that you can write as a product of n generators, you will get um, a function which is something like e to the n to the 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.76. So something fractional, well, some, some stretched exponential. So it's become a very important example in group theory because of lots of other properties that it has. I don't want to go too much in details on that, just this is another example of an automatic action because the generators are given by automata. Here, the group is generated by four elements, and I put them together in the same automaton but with a different starting state. So the starting state is, in, is indicated by the letter that I wrote in it. OK, so that's a special case of an omega regular or automatic action. And uh, an important feature about these is that they have no look ahead. So not only do you act on infinite strings as the definition asks, we also act on finite strings. When we, we're given a string of length n, we know the result as a string of length n. And uh, said more um, intrinsically, these are equicontinuous actions. Equicontinuous means that you will not have an unbounded look ahead that is necessary to describe the action. And in fact, here the look ahead is 0. So there's a subclass consisting of uh, free actions, or free regular actions. <coughs> There's a subclass consisting of equicontinuous actions. And these are the two examples that we've seen for now. But I want to go to something yet different, which is, oh, I had another example. Should I skip this one? Yeah, the basilica. That's another good example to know. So these automatic actions also come as uh, ways of describing dynamical systems. So in particular, for complex dynamical systems, and the example that I gave is this. The basilica is uh, the fractal, the Julia set corresponding to the map z squared minus 1. It's the place where the map z squared minus 1 is chaotic. It does not converge to infinity or to a cycle, 0 minus 1. <coughs> and the Schreier graphs, so the graphs of the action, in fact converge towards this fractal. So there's a beautiful theory by Nikrashevich that explains very well uh, the duality 
between expanding dynamical systems and group actions of this kind. Okay, but now I want to get to an uh, example which really use the infiniteness of the words on which you act. And these will be substitutional subshifts. So again, it's unfortunate that we, maybe I can move the mouse <coughs> and we won't see this. Oop, no, it doesn't. This. Yeah, okay. So <coughs> the next example I want to, to describe is that of a substitutional subshift. Here's the one that does not read two consecutive ones. It's called golden mean, golden mean subshift. <coughs> and it corresponds uh, to uh, Fibonacci numbers. And in fact, just as we had before the binary encoding uh, for the uh, uh, plus one operation action of Z, here we can associate a number system in a plus one operation by encoding numbers as sum of Fibonacci numbers. And when you express an integer as a sum of Fibonacci numbers, the rule is that you must never take two consecutive Fibonacci numbers. That would be exactly taking two consecutive ones. So this is forbidden. And then every number has an essentially unique description in this manner. Well, it helps to modify a little bit the system by encoding the strips of zeros by their parity. So I'm never putting two consecutive zeros or two consecutive zero tick, but I'm alternating zero, zero tick, zero, zero tick. And then I do a one, and then I do again some sequence of zeros alternating and so on. It's important to do this so as to be able to, be ex to express the plus one operation. And this is exactly the plus one operation. So it starts here, and when it sees zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, it keeps writing some zeros instead, and then it drops a carry, just as we had before and then it gets to the identity that we had before. So expressed in base Fibonacci, this is exactly the plus one operation that we had before, <coughs> also um, <coughs> for the binary addition. OK, so the, Oop. again, remove this. I guess I should define what I am talking about. So fix <coughs> sigma alphabet and phi a substitution. Just for every letter in sigma, we give ourselves a word. <coughs> Let's take also an initial letter. And when then we look at iterates of our letter under the substitution. And let's assume that uh, this contains all letters. Then you construct a subshift x, which is the set of sequences by infinite sequences indexed by sigma, such that all subwords are subwords of phi to the n of sigma 0 for some n big enough. So the language of the subshift, namely the subwords that you see, are exactly the subwords that you see inside iterates of this substitution. <coughs> so this has an obvious z action, which is just shifting a sequence. On the other hand, to understand it as a space, is pretty complicated. It's just the set of words that, that satisfy this property. So uh, easy theorem, this is an automatic action. Namely, you can re-encode this as an omega regular language in such a way that the plus one operation, yes? Uh, so if you give any fine, it does not satisfy this property. No, no, no. If you find it just eventually if I to the end contains a letter. Yes. Then you always can find a at least one. Yes. That contains all subwords of 
Yes. Well, the action on the empty set is automatic. But to answer your question directly, yes, it will be non-empty. Because you can take uh, all these phi to the n of sigma 0 and <coughs> extend them in an arbitrary manner, and then take an accumulation point. So just by compacity. So I, oh, sorry, so it should be finite. Well, if I say it contains all letters, that's automatic. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is an automatic action. This is not difficult, and it's essentially rephrasing what, what has been done, say, uh, using the bratelli verschick diagrams, except that most of the theory works uh, very well in the measure category. And here, we really want on the nose uh, the, the spaces. OK, this is an automatic action, and it's very far from the Grigorchuk kinds of actions. Because this is expensive. Every action on a subshift is expensive, meaning distinct points can be made at a bounded distance apart using the group action. OK, so now I want to make a remark that all the structures that we saw for now so all these automatic actions have some very nice extra property. And these, this is that they are bounded actions. <coughs> so for this, I will just define a bounded automaton. So they will be the automata representing the actions on, say, uh, alphabet. A cross A. <coughs> so these are such that there exists a bound, B, such that for every n, if I look at the number of paths in the automaton, from a start state, to a non-identity state. This number of paths is at most the bound B. So I could flip back to my slides. But if you remember, for the adding machine, the von neumann kakutani transformation. There was just a single loop reading ones and printing zeros. For the u, there was a single loop reading ones and printing ones. And then it went in finitely many steps to the identity. For the Grigorcho group, there was a three cycle going through the ones. And then this was feeding away to the identity. And for the last example of the Fibonacci uh, subshift with a plus one uh, operation, there was a cycle going from 0, 1 to 0, tick, zero, zero, 0, tick. And so you could remain on this cycle as long as you wanted, but then you had to go to the identity. So in all of these cases, there is an, for every n, at most probably two or three paths that do not lead to the identity. It's also clear that this uh, property of being bounded is preserved on the composition and under inverses. <coughs> inverses is obvious. You're flipping input and output. In composition, where the, the constants b will multiply at worst. So this uh, defines a subgroup. So there are lots of interesting examples which are not bounded, yes? Uh, an identity state in a state in which all the inputs and the outputs are the same. So if you remember from the previous uh, pictures, there was always uh, a copy of the identity of the language. So the language appears, L appears as the diagonal, reading and out re printing the same symbol. So there's always a subautomaton, which is the diagonal of the language. And you count the paths that do not reach, that do not end in the diagonal of the language. Do we assume that in the domain they uh, recognize functional relations? 
So I was talking just about uh, automatic actions. So yes, it's, uh, so if, you take, if you're given an automaton which is not functional, then perhaps it's a partially defined transformation, and this is perfectly fine for us. Or it could be something much more complicated, and then probably it will not be bounded. Yeah. OK, and I think I want to give just one theorem on these. So a general theorem. Which is that if g acting on x is bounded, automatic, and let's see also finitely generated. So finitely many generators which are all bounded to transformations, then the orbit relation is regular. So I guess this will be expressed formally as, well, if I keep my coding, That's what we had before for the, for the graph. But here I do this for all x in the language and for all g in the group. So it's presumably a countable union of uh, relations. So this is regular. And even more so, it's effectively omega regular. So there is a procedure that, given a bounded automatic action, computes for you this relation. <coughs> so this is really, if you forget the pi about the encoding, if I look at the set of x, y, so that the orbit of g is equal to the orbit of y. Or I could also ask the orbit, uh, well, x, say, to belong to the closure of the orbit of y, topologically. Or I could also ask, so that's the same thing as this, of course. There are lots of variants of this result. Oop. So I have to write somewhere. Let's switch this. I should stop in five minutes, right? Sorry? Ah, okay. So uh, maybe I can just say uh, one word on a sketch of the proof. of proof. And this is really inspired by uh, an article by Jan Philipp Wächter and is he here? No, ah, okay. I'm, I think Bondarenko. I'm not entirely sure about that. Well, the question mark is, is for this plus. Uh, well, the question mark is for the whole thing here. <laughs> so uh, they prove, uh, they have a very nice paper that proves that given a bounded action, but in a, in a more restrictive setting of a no look ahead, <coughs> it's decidable if the group is infinite. But in fact, uh, the ideas are very close to what is necessary here. So you construct transducer, so you construct an automaton for this relation. Let's call this orbit relation. <coughs> and the states will be graphs. Uh, so it will be uh, Schreier graphs. So the action of G. And at your initial state, your graph just has finitely many generators that say how you act on a point. <coughs> and then you will recognize 
some pairs of letters A, B, and this is exactly how you recognize the relation. Now, if you're at a graph that will look like this, and some of these will be labeled by generators, J, H, and so on, <coughs> to look at its transitions, see under the letter A, B, the first thing you do is you multiply every state, every vertex of this graph by the alphabet. And then you put the transitions here as they should be, say, given by the automaton. So these G and H are automata. So they have a successor state under the input A or B. Also, these graphs, I should say, must have a starting and ending vertex. And then this choice of A, B tells you which is the correct starting and which is the correct ending vertex. And now because of the bounded condition, when you look at the successive action in the automaton, very often you will see identity. In fact, only bounded many times you will not see an identity. So lots of these labels will be a one, and you compress them. And sometimes also these two things will not be in the same connected component, and then you die. There's just no way of going from here to here by the action. And then every once in a while, you will also allow yourself some accepting transitions, which are those where there is a single loop, there is, single, uh, there is a single G. And this is essentially the automaton. OK, so now, in the last few minutes, I want to show how this general fact is useful to answer uh, quite a few important questions. <coughs> So in particular, if you're given <coughs> a substitutional subshift, meaning you're given the substitution, and you're just told, well, it is what is defined by this substitution, it's decidable. So it's decidable if the shift is empty. But this was already known, right? You had asked this question. So we can decide other things. We can decide if it's uh, periodic. So every point is periodic. Let me put empty. It's decided if it's aperiodic. It's decidable if it's minimal. It's def def decidable if it's topologically transitive. And quite a few other such things. <coughs> So, for example, to decide if it's periodic, well, you have to ask, is it true that for every x, there are not infinitely many points that you can reach by the z action? And this is exactly a first order formula in the, what was erased here. It's expressed with these counting quantifiers. To know if it's aperiodic, you have to say, for every x, there exists omega many points which are reachable under the orbit relation. This is also decidable thanks to these uh, quantifier-enhanced first-order formulas. Minimal means every point has a dense orbit. So using this one, that's also directly testable because you can express it as first order. Topologically transitive means there exists an x for which the closure of the orbit is everything. It's also, oh, you're here, Jan Philip. Oh, I was told that you were in the other room. <laughs> so this is joint with, uh, with Yevgen, right? Yes, good. <coughs> so these are decidable, but for complexity, we have to go by this crazy first order thing. Uh, yes, if you want to estimate the complexity in terms of how difficult the substitution is, uh, that's a very interesting question, and uh, I haven't thought enough about it. I would expect this to be very difficult. I mean, uh, Sorry, you, you said, uh, does that need to be a bounded action uh, or an every substitution of such a thing? Oh, sorry. I, I completely forgot. Yes. So that's uh, another theorem. <laughs> For substitutional subshift, action is bounded. Mm -hmm. 
in fact, I have sort of an idea. Uh, it's, um, it's purely speculation. But I expect, in fact, that a Z action on a counter set will be bounded if and only if it can be written as a substitution of a subshift. And um, <coughs> here's a notion that I have never seen in the literature, but maybe some people on substitution know this. Take a substitution, uh, no, so take a subshift for which the language is the set of subwords of an EDT0L language. Right? So this defines uh, a subshift. <coughs> if the EDT0 language happens to be just iterating one morphism, then it's substitution. So I would expect that a, a Z action on a counter set is automatic if and only if it can be written as an EDT0 L subshift. You have the dynamics on the EDT0 L by the sub substitution. I talked to Sebastian about this in the bus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a general result and it gives you lots of decidability properties. And yeah, um, <coughs> another corollary is that it's decidable <coughs> if uh, an element, or if a G given, say G, again, a bounded automatic, So given here this decidable, I should switch the order. <coughs> given G in the group, if G has infinite order. So the order problem for a group of bounded transformations is decidable. And that's again because when well, you look at the restricted action to the cyclic group generated by G, and you use exactly these results. So this was already known for uh, equicontinuous actions, actions on trees with no look ahead. But it's true in this much more general setting. And I wanted to give a warning sign also. And this is uh, myself plus Mitrofanov, which is that it's undecidable for general automatic actions. So a general automatic action can do so many things in different places that you can simulate Turing machines. But with this bounded property, you can only work in like one direction. And this is why the orbit structure is so much nicer. Uh, I guess I'm out of time now. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Is there any question? Dima. So, so would that be uh, correct to say, most likely at least true in one direction, so if you have uh, uh, automatic action, uh, then uh, say of uh, a finitely generated group, then uh, every shared graph of this action will be uh, automatic in the uh, automatic structure sense. And then is that true in the opposite direction as well? Well, if it's a marked, a uh, graph in which you remember which generator is which edge, then it's exactly the same notion. Yes. It's exactly, I could have defined them as Schreier automatic as opposed to Cayley automatic, if you want. No, but I mean, so you remember with labeled graphs. So you, you have uh, infinite family of the Schreier graphs, like for example, talking about the group uh, actions on, uh, on the boundary of root of tree, right? So there is yes. an uncountable number of Schreier graphs. Yes. And then the, the original action on this boundary will be, I guess, automatic, if only if all the shared graphs will be automatic. Is that the case? Um, <coughs> so what, do, what does it mean to say a Schreier graph is automatic as a graph? As automatic structure. OK, so that's not true. That's my question. <laughs> yeah, it's not true because, because um, the Schreier graph that you look at, if you just look at one graph, requires you to take one ray and then look at the action on that ray. Yeah. So in many cases, uh, this action on that ray lets you uh, recover what the ray is. So different Schreier graphs will be non-isomorphic. Yeah. And then you have uncountably many. You have a continuum mm -hmm. of different Schreier graphs, so they cannot all be encoded by finite data. 
as here. What is true yeah. is that if you look at all the Schreier graphs of periodic sequences, mm -hmm. for example, then these will be automatic if and only if the whole structure is automatic. Right. So, f for yeah, example, so you can get down to the countable world if you want. Uh, if you consider just some uh, automaton group and its action on the uh, boundary of the tree on this counter set, it will essentially never be automatic. Oh, no, the, the whole action will be automatic. But yes, just extracting a leaf yeah. is not automatic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. And uh, if you are given uh, the actions of uh, finitely many group elements, then is boundedness itself decidable? Well, how are you given the, uh, the transformations? Uh, I guess you are given the omega, this omega regular. Yes. So if you're given an omega regular language <coughs> that defines the action, you can minimize it. And the minimal automaton will be bounded if the action is bounded. So to test boundedness, you're already given the automaton. You don't have to do something crazy to find the bounded automaton for the element. It will be the minimal one. And it is easy to recognize whether it is bounded. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's very easy because uh, essentially you look at the adjacency matrix of the graph. And it must, uh, must have a single eigenvalue 1, probably. If there's an eigenvalue bigger than 1, it means you have connecting loops. And if the multiplicity is bigger than 1, it means you have chained loops. So for example, that kind of, well, it's, it's a finite structure on which <coughs> you, well, there are lots of ways of saying it. But you can uh, <coughs> say that you will, given two vertices, you can ask if there's a path from one to the other. So you can compute strongly connected components. <coughs> and then the assertion is that there's a single strongly connected component, which is a cycle. And then everything else feeds to another component, which is the identity. Yeah, an, an interesting notion, which I have not explored enough, would be something like relative boundedness. So you're given a sub-automaton, and you're bounded on top of something. So this is just looking at bounded on top of the identity. But it, it would make a lot of sense to look at bounded on top of something different. Yeah, and all of this is easily checkable by straightforward graph algorithms. These are all finite structures. No more questions? And then, uh. Is a uh, suffix subshift on C an automatic action? Oh, yes, yes. So, um, if, um, So if you're given a, well, first, a uh, subshift of finite type, uh, you can look at the one-sided shift. And that's automatically going to be a, a sophic, uh, sorry, um, a automatic action, because the automaton can just delete a letter and keep acting. If you're working with a two-sided shift, you can also use a trick like this one, pushing and pulling, a conveyor belt kind of, of, of description. Um, whether this fits. In all cases, you can then take quotients. So take quotients of subshifts of finite type, so sophic shifts, by putting an extra layer of encoding. Okay, I'm slightly sorry. nervous whether it's, it will only work for n actions and not z actions. But then but definitely the sophic for n actions is, is part of this, yes. Okay, sorry. So then the automaticity of the action is kind of easy, but I guess that the structure of the space is encoded on that L, which requires yeah, to be so regular. Yeah, so for right. a sophic shift, yeah, you would, you would uh, directly have the L. And the action will be by deleting a letter on L. So um, here, the importance of substitutional subshifts in connection to this story is that you have two dynamics. You have a translation dynamics, the Z action on sequences, and you have a blow up or um, desubstitute dynamics in the other direction. Just as here you have automata, which read words and print words uh, sort of uh, at the same speed, synchronously, and you have the shifting operation, like deleting a word, which is moving one step further in the automata. So a lot of the, of the properties come 
from playing one of these actions against the other, and in particular, some sort of a contraction property. So when you want to encode, uh, say, subshifts of finite type or suffix shifts, you're not seeing both. They, they, they become the same action, and you're not going to gain much from expressing them in this language. But they are part of it. Thanks. Uh, then uh, let's uh, thank Laurent again. Thank you.